Holy sh- don't get me wrong. I love my Explorer, but it looks a little bit like a stink bug. The front end? Way lower than the back end. The reason why is because, one, there's a 1200 pound Cummins sitting in the front of this Explorer, and two, the lift springs in the front are two inch lift springs from an Explorer. On the rear, I did a spring over axle swap, which gave it six or eight inches of lift. Those springs are way too small. Luckily, however, these springs just came in. And I've even got some shocks to go with them. This is the difference in these two springs. Not only is this one quite a few inches taller, this one is actually for an F-150 and it's a much higher spring rate. So not only is it way taller, it won't compress as much with the weight of that Cummins sitting on it, which will give me even more lift. These might be overkill. I actually don't know yet. There's a chance I might have to cut these down, but in order to figure it out, I'm gonna have to throw them on and we'll see. Well, that was pretty stupid. The chain broke. That's what you get for buying cheap chain. I really should have gotten better chain. I bet you guys were thinking that it was gonna be the cherry picker that was gonna give me an issue, not the freaking chain. That sucks. So I had that spring out already, which kind of sucks because it means it's sitting on the bump stop in there and it hit that bump stop pretty hard. And the thing that's concerning about that is that's just in the factory location and whatnot. I never really set that. And because my bump stop wasn't set, I think that that arm probably ran into the frame pretty hard when it dropped. So once I pick it back up, I need to take a look at that arm and make sure I didn't damage it. Because I'm pretty sure that thing ran into the frame since I don't have any bump stops set. That was exciting. Unfortunately, it was exciting in a bad way. I should have been more careful and used a better chain. Don't be like me. At the very least, if you're gonna be like me, never stand in the line of fire of a chain like that or underneath it or anywhere that you could get hurt when you're overloading something like that. Happy with my motor mounts. They didn't get ripped out of the car or anything and they don't seem bent. Transmission slammed into that a little bit where it was a little tight. I don't know if I'm putting this in the video or not. If I do, take it as a warning. Be really careful. Use way more chain than you need to. Never be under it when you're lifting with Something like a cherry picker, obviously. Never be to the side of a chain when it's loaded. I didn't get hurt, everything's fine. I don't think I damaged the vehicle, so let's keep on. If you've seen any of my previous videos, I'm almost always wearing safety glasses when I'm lifting and doing stuff like this, because I'm always paranoid if something breaks, the most dangerous thing might be that piece of chain flying towards my head and not necessarily it landing on me because I'm not going to be underneath it. For whatever reason, I was not wearing safety glasses when I did that, so lesson learned. When I'm using chains, even if I might be being overcautious, I'm going to keep wearing my safety glasses from now on. Weird that the one time I don't wear them is the one time it blows up. It's funny how it works that way. And once again, good, do good job Harbor Freight cherry picker. It says two ton on it, and while I don't believe that it's going to do two tons, it lived up to that when the chain didn't, so what it's worth.
So I found the limit. This is how far it'll droop before it starts binding. So there's my max droop with these radius arms I built forever ago. These arms still have some movement in the joint, so I'm pretty sure it's not actually the radius arms bending at this point. I think it's actually the axle shaft. So that's the limit of my droop, and I think it's limited by the inner axles. So that's good to know for the future. It's kind of a lot. So I figured out where it's binding. It's actually that U-joint is running into itself right there. It doesn't have enough travel in it. So, but that's good news. There's absolutely no binding anywhere in my suspension until I get to the limits of that U-joint. Cool, it's good to know. All right, I got it in. I used a combination of just turning that axle shaft until it was in a position where it had the most travel. And then it was only like a quarter inch from getting in at that point. So I just used a ratchet strap on either side as a spring compressor. Be better to use a spring compressor. I knew it was gonna be tall. I didn't actually think it was gonna be this tall. I thought it would be two or three inches too tall. It's more like four or five or six. So the front's way too tall now. I figured when I bought these springs, I might as well get the springs that I knew were a little too long rather than the ones that might have been a little too short because if they're long, I can cut them down and if they're too short, I can't really do anything about it. So. Next things next, I'm going to cut these to length. I wanted to make sure I got them installed and the vehicle resting on them so that I can actually measure their installed height before I cut them and make sure I'm cutting the right amount out. That also means my brake lines and everything will hopefully fit by the time I'm done too, so that's good. It might even imply that my, that axle shaft that was binding is actually okay. We'll see about that. I am going to need to extend my shocks though. One thing to keep in mind when I do this is these springs have this little bar here that shoots across and that has kind of been in my way this whole time anyways. In fact, I kind of had to hammer on this to make it sit all the way in. So when I cut this off, I'll actually be glad to be rid of that spot. The coil is not gonna sit flat in there like it should, but I knew I was gonna have to make coil spring retainers for this anyways because this didn't fit perfect, so I'll just make coil spring retainers and it'll be okay that the top of the spring isn't flat. Alternatively, after I cut it, I could come in and heat the coil that I cut in order to flatten it out and make it sit right up here, but I don't trust the stock reten uh, coil retention system anyways. It's not that good. And I don't want to heat this up and ruin the material. I do feel comfortable cutting it with an angle grinder because it's 5160 steel and even though Cutting it with abrasives is gonna heat it up a little. I don't think it's going to do it enough to matter on something like 5160, but I don't wanna take a torch and flatten it out because that's gonna be way more heat and I would be worried about it at that point. I don't wanna to have to reheat treat these heat treat these springs, so I'd rather just go with a custom spring retainer than worrying about getting the top of the spring to be the perfect shape. So at the risk of over explaining this, I just wanna point something out that might be obvious to you, it might not. If I want to move this tire up by four or five inches, that doesn't mean that I cut four or five inches out of that spring. Change in this point results in a greater change in this point in height. One question you might have is, okay, so how much does it change by? Well, let's take a look. So how do we figure out how much we change the coil by in order to raise the tire by however much we want to raise the tire by? Well, let's say we have the pivot point there, the coil there, in the center of the tire there, a distance there of 34 inches, a distance there of about 14 inches, which leaves 20 inches there. Well, that's the same thing as having a triangle. And we wanted say a five inch raise in the position of the tire we want to know what sort of lift does that correspond to on this. This is the same thing as having two triangles. And we want to know 5 inch is to 34 inch as x is to 20 inch. And that gives us our ratios. 5 times 20 over 34 equals the distance x that we're moving. Or 100 over 34. 
which is a basically three inches. If we cut three inches out of the spring, we'll move the tie rod by five inches. Another way to say that is this 20 inches compared to 34 inches, that's our ratio. If we take this ratio and multiply it by whatever our height is here, that gives us what our height of the spring is for whatever height we want to plug in here. For every one inch of height we change the tire, we get 5 eighths of an inch in our spring. So that's our ratio, that's what we need to keep in mind is that the amount we cut out of the spring will be magnified by 8 over 5 to equal our wheel height. working on this yesterday I mentioned that it was way taller than I had expected it to be and I figured out one of the factors that I had overlooked was actually that after jacking it up in the middle so much and the tires were sitting like this because it's TTB the tires kind of just bound up like that because they were sticking to the concrete so one thing that would have set me at actual ride height instead of how extreme that angle was is I just needed to pull out the tires so that they were sitting closer to ride height. I got the shortened coil springs in. This is how much I cut out of each of the springs. And so now I'm going to pull the tires out to see how much that changes the camera setting that's on them. That pivot's sitting at 24 inches right now. all the way off the jack and now that's sitting at 21 inches. So it was three inches too high just because I hadn't settled the tires. So if you're ever doing an alignment on a TTB, make sure you have a really good set of floating plates under your wheels, otherwise you'll never get it right. Speaking of alignment, these are cambered pretty bad, but at this height, I actually think I'll be able to get a decent alignment set into it. I guess we'll find out. So, this is what the car looks like. It is much more even now. Um, full disclosure, it is about three quarters of an inch lower in the front than the back now, but that's well within the margin of error. I'm just gonna run it like that for now. And once everything's settled and I actually have all the steering and everything in it, I'll remeasure it and make sure that that's actually where it's at. The next big thing I wanna deal with on the front is I want to add coil spring retainers. This is an Explorer with a Cummins, obviously, and a Dana 50 front end out of an F250, the rear end out of a Ram 2500. I'm piecing lots of random parts together. And when you do that, things don't always interface correctly. Like, for example, these coil springs being out of an F150 for this F250 axle that's going in an Explorer wasn't designed for it and it's not perfect. Not to mention me having to cut it as well. One way that I'm going to make up for that is I'm going to add coil spring retainers so that even though these springs aren't the perfect shape for the top of this coil bucket, you can see the diameter is a little too big and a couple things like that. Even though it's not the perfect shape, with coil spring retainers, I know it's not going to give me any issue. It's never going to fall out. I got the brake caliper back on. Let's see if my brake lines are going to be long enough or not. I didn't have the spring retainers on and that's why I need them so that doesn't happen, but I got lots of room left in the brake line so that tells me that's fine.
There it is, it works. I have the full weight of the coil on here. It's bound up on the bottom. I don't have the bottom mount tightened all the way, but bottom mount's working, top mount's working. So this coil spring retainer will work fine. The weld turned out kind of like crap. It's been a long time since I've done aluminum welding and this thin sheet welding to the outside of a tube is kind of a weird weld to do. So I'm not proud of the weld, but it'll hold, it's fine. I think I will paint this black so that it matches the rest of the chassis, but other than that, I think that'll work great. One thing I like about this design is that it still allows me to rotate the coil in here if I need. So by rotating this coil, I can actually get a little bit of adjustment in the height, just a hair. So I'm glad that I can still rotate the coil in here with the spring retainer. I didn't want to do a design that would lock the position of the coil perfectly. When I tighten the bottom nut, it's not going to be able to rotate while it's in the car, but with everything loose, I'll be able to rotate it to adjust it to where I want, so that's great. Here's the second one for the other coil. The welds turned out a lot better. I guess that little bit, of, little bit of practicing helped. They're still not great. They're definitely better than the other ones. Aluminum is a very interesting material to weld. It's, it's definitely a different skill set welding aluminum. I should practice it more. All right, here she is. She's level. Coils work. I don't have the front suspension quite settled yet, so it's got a little more camera than it should be, but that's coil springs in, body leveled. Got coil spring retainers on it to make sure the coils won't pop out when I'm off-roading. It's enough work for one video. So thank you for watching. If you liked it, leave a like, subscribe and stick around if you want to see the next one, and thanks for hanging out with me in my garage today. Hope to see you next time.